Um, thanks for joining us today, December 19th. This is the uh, Bud Matheny chapter uh, December meeting where we're going to discuss uh, the book Bonsai Babe by uh, Dr. Robert Fitz. Uh, Dr. Fitz was kind enough to join us, and so uh, I will let Mr. Frank Holman give us a, an introduction for Dr. Fitz. Frank? Well, Rob, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, I've known Rob and his works, um, and he's my dealer on top of everything for a number of things in my collection. We've known each other almost two decades, Rob. I Frank, I, I want to clarify that. He's your baseball card dealer. <laughs> so we'll, let that, we'll let that, we'll, we'll, we'll think about what that meant later. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, Rob has a, an interesting background. Uh, he's a former archaeologist, a PhD from Brown, and left academics to follow this passion of Japanese baseball. Uh, he's an award-winning author and speaker. His articles appear in numerous magazines and websites, including nine the Baseball Research Journal, um, National Pastime, Sports Collector's Digest, which I think just um, said some great things about your, your newest book on cards as well. And he's on MLB.com. He's written six books on Japanese baseball. The most recent book is Issei Baseball, the story of the first Japanese American ball players, and also put out a pandemic book, an illustrated introduction into Japanese baseball cards which is highly recommended. Uh, both were released in this crazy year of 2020. His earlier books include Mashi, The Unfulfilled Baseball Dreams of Masanori Murakami, who was the uh, first Japanese major leaguer, pitched for the Giants in 64, 65. Uh, Banzai Babe Ruth, which is why we're all here today. Uh, Wally Yanamine, The Man Who Changed Japanese Baseball. And Remembering Japanese Baseball, which was my introduction to Rob, uh, which is an oral history of the game uh, for uh, players who played Japanese baseball. He's also the founder of the Sabres Asian Baseball Committee and received the Seymour Medal uh, for the Best Baseball Book of 2012, which again is this book that we're, we're here today for. He's won uh, the McFarland Sabre baseball, baseball Research Award in 2019, the Pappas Award, for the best oral research presentation at the annual convention and the 2006 Sporting News Saber Research Award. He's been a finalist for the Casey Award and a silver medalist for the Independent Published Book Awards. Um, he's a popular speaker. Um, if you troll podcasts, you'll find Rob on many podcasts. And he's a speaker on history of Japanese baseball, but he's spoken at venues including the Library of Congress, the Japan Embassy in Washington, the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, the Japan Society of New York, the Asia Society of New York, the Nine Baseball Conference, the Sabre Annual Convention, and the American Club in Tokyo. He can now add the Bud Matheny chapter of Sabre to a <laughs> long list of speaking engagements. You can put that on your, your, your CV, Rob. Absolutely. So, yeah, you'll need to update your Wikipedia page. <laughs> we'll all be doing that later. Um, you know, while living in Tokyo in 9394, he, uh, Rob began collecting <laughs> Japanese baseball cards. And you may want to share how that started. Um, but he's now recognized as one of the leading experts in the field. And he was a finalist uh, for Sabres Jefferson Burdick Award. Um, if you don't know Jefferson Burdick, you need to look this guy up. Um, but he's uh, been nominated for a life, uh, finalist based on his lifetime contributions to the baseball card hobby. He regularly writes and speaks about the history of Japanese baseball cards. He maintains a, a, a nice little e-business, Rob's Japanese Cards, which is located at robfits.com. As I've told him before, there's not another author that I drive 400 miles to go see. So this mm -hmm. cool thing saved me some wear and tear. And I just want to thank you again for joining us Saturday, this Saturday morning, Rob. <laughs> thank you, Frank. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> Well, yeah, now we ran out of time, so thanks for joining us. <laughs> so, so Robert, what inspired you to become uh, an expert in Japanese baseball? Well, what happened was I was always a baseball fan, like everybody else here. You know, started when I was a kid, um, and I was just a fan. Um, 
until my wife was transferred to Tokyo in 1993. And I was lucky, I was working on my PhD at the time, my classes were finished. Uh, so I tagged along, packed up my computer and my books and uh, worked, uh, finished up my dissertation while living in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, my very first night in Tokyo, I, I don't know if I put this in the introduction to the book, so you may have heard this story already, but um, I showed up jet lagged after the 13 hour flight and basically the 24 hour trip and took a shower, all ready to go. My wife comes back from the office. I uh, haven't seen her for a month. And she's like, oh good, you're dressed, we're going out. And I'm like, what? And she puts me on this packed subway and we show up at the Jingu Stadium in downtown Tokyo. And so she, she uh, her coworkers have given her uh, really good tickets as a welcoming present for me. And so I'm at my first Japanese baseball game, my first couple of hours in Japan. And I was really unprepared for what happened next. If any of you have seen videos of Japanese baseball games, it's like going to a top 10 um, college basketball game. There's bands, there's brass sections, there's flag waving, and it was a zoo. And the old stadium, Jingu Stadium was uh, built in the 1920s, was shaking from the noise of the fans and, and the, the songs being played. They play a different song for every batter who, sh who comes up. Um, it was just amazing. And that night I would say I fell in love with Japanese baseball and it's true. Um, I was hooked. And uh, next morning, I, um, my wife, uh, Sarah's old college roommate was Japanese and the roommate came by the hotel and Sarah went to work to show me around Tokyo. And instead of going to the museums, I said, let's go find Japanese baseball cards. And we went searching Tokyo to find some uh, cards. And so from day one in Japan, I was hooked on um, Japanese baseball. So what happened was, my two years I spent in Japan, I continued as a fan, um, watched games, I collected baseball cards. And that turned into a business of, well, first it was a massive collection of cards. And then it turned into a business selling my doubles. When you start to sell doubles to Japanese baseball, and this is pre-1996, uh, or actually it started in about 94 and went to uh, 2000. So Nomo had just come over, but Ichiro hadn't come over. How do you convince Americans they want vintage Japanese baseball cards? Because here I have thousands of them sitting in the attic and I need to sell them. So I started writing. And I started writing little bios at first of uh, Tetsuharu Kawakami, known as the god of batting, the greatest player of the 1950s. So trying to convince Americans that, hey, you wanted his baseball card. And those bios started to add up and it became a self-published book. And I was like, you know, this is kind of fun. Um, at that time, there was almost nothing written on Japanese baseball in English. So I had read everything many times over. And I had a lot of questions um, about the history of the game, the players. So I guess this is about... 2003, I started reaching out to former um, players who had played in Japan. And because of the language barrier, I reached out to Americans and I started doing interviews. You know, basically I wanted to know not so much about their experiences in Japan, because I had read Robert Whiting's book about Japanese baseball, but I wanted to know about the, their fellow players and the Japanese. And these interviews ended up becoming my first book, uh, Remembering Japanese Baseball, which, um, as Frank said, is an oral history of the game over there. And I had so much fun, I was hooked. So I left my job as an archaeologist at that point and decided to become a full-time baseball writer because that's what I wanted to do. Awesome. So uh, by your answer, you don't speak Japanese. I don't. I lived there two two years. And at the end of two years, you know, I could get by, I can buy my groceries and things like that. If I was out at a dinner party, I could often understand kind of what was going on around me, but I couldn't really speak. And a lot of times um, I certainly didn't understand any nuances. I mean, I'd be lucky if I could pick up the topic being talked about. I never learned. Um, I've taken Japanese one, two, and three about five times. 
And around Japanese three, it starts to get really, really hard. And um, each time I made the decision is I could spend all my time focusing on Japanese and probably be able to speak and read a little bit in three or four years, or I can go back to baseball writing. And I've always enjoyed the writing and the research far more than the language. So that's why. So, so when you were researching uh, Bonsai Babe, did you use any Japanese sources, like direct Japanese sources for your research? And, and if you did, how did you get that translated or was it already translated? Absolutely, I used a lot of Japanese resources and I do for all my books actually. Um, I have two research assistants. One is the aforementioned uh, wife's roommate. Uh, she ended up becoming a professional simultaneous uh, interpreter. Ah. And she's a little bit um, too professional and too expensive for me to use all the time. But as a friend, she'll come and help me out. And the other person actually was my wife's secretary when she was working in uh, Japan. And uh, so when I go back, she helps me out. And uh, she acts as my translator and also research assistant. So what will happen is I'll go, once I've done all my research. So if I start a project, I, I start out in these states. And I, I basically try to exhaust the English language research uh, sources first. And then I come up with all the questions of like, all right, what would I like to know in Japanese? And at that point, I take a trip to Japan um, and I go to the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame Library and with a translator with me. And we sit down and we talk to the head librarian and say, all right, what is there exactly on this topic? Um, and we start getting to the sources and we make Xerox copies. And then we'll go back to the hotel room and the best way to translate is it's very expensive to translate word to word, you know, to give it to a translator is we'll sit in the hotel room and we'll grab an article and my research assistant will read it quickly in her, in her brain. And then she'll summarize it for me. Mm. And I'll often just take notes on the summers on the summary. And then other times I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. That one, let's mark that one. You know, when I go back to, to New York, you're going to keep this Xerox and you're going to translate this one word for word. Um, so it's really, honestly, very expensive to do this um, and time consuming. So I have to be very judicial in what sources I decide to translate. Interesting. So um, does, does Cooperstown have much information on Japanese baseball? Very little. Um, I mean, really very, very little. They don't have a good collection of books. Um, they don't have any primary sources. Occasionally there will be something um, in their papers, but not usually. Okay, interesting. So what, as you go about and you write, you know, you write a kind of a, um, a three tiered book like Bonsai Babe, right? There's kind of three simultaneous storylines going on. Um, so it, it really appeals both to people who like baseball and people who like history, right? It's, it's a very um, well-written book in that, in that regard. Um, how do you go about tackling the challenge of making it interesting to a baseball fan and not killing them with the history? I mean, mo most people who would pick a book up like this, I'll, sh I'll show the book, most people who would pick this book up like some sort of history anyway, but not, you know, we're not all history buffs. So how do you, how do you balance that when you write a book like this? That's really the hardest part. So I have, um, my undergraduate degree is in, in both history and anthropology. And when I was an archeologist, I was a historical archeologist. I uh, focused on colonial America and 19th century America. So I'm really a historian. Um, so I'm interested in history. So for me, I tend to get wrapped up in the history. My first draft of Issei baseball, which is about the uh, Japanese immigrant baseball in the beginning of the 20th century, I had about 40 pages of um, late 19th century Japanese history and the Meiji Restoration in there and the Civil Wars. And my first two readers just said, uh, no, 
you <laughs> get down to a couple pages, you know, and then my Nebraska editor is always like, no, get it down to two paragraphs. Um, so I tend to go a little too heavy on the history of my first drafts. And then I'm constantly cutting it down um, based on feedback from other readers. And if you look at my book reviews, um, it's a real balance because a lot of, most of my negative reviews will be like, oh, it's just too much history in here. Where's the baseball? And then I'll get a historian who reads it. And it's like, oh man, who cares what, who won this game back in the, uh, you know, 1934, why isn't there more history? So it is a tough balance. Um, and I think as a writer, that limits my um, uh, my market. I mean, basically I tend to be, I'm writing for myself and you guys. I'm writing for people who basically share my approach to history, which are Sabre members. People who like baseball, but like um, a broader context and an interesting story. Right, right. Well, at least for my opinion, I don't speak for everybody on this call. I, I thought it was a good, well-balanced. And uh, although I, I will admit a couple couple sections, I may have nodded off for a few minutes because it got a little too deep in history, but uh, I woke back up and finished the book. So uh, I thought it was a good balance. Um, Can I just add, I wanna... the book is, is actually modeled after um, Eric Larson's Devil in the White City. And I don't know how many of you have read that, but mm -hmm. it is a dual book about a um, a um, serial murderer in Chicago in 1890, and also the 1890 um, Chicago's World Fair. And it's probably, I mean, most popular historians consider perhaps the best history book ever written. It's it's arguable, but I mean, it's really in the top ten list of almost everybody's. And so I was so taken by that book that that's what uh, Banzai is modeled after with the different stories running through. Right. Excellent. I, I, uh, I've never read that. I, I've written it down. I, I will. I, I'm sure there's a Kindle edition of that somewhere out there that I can, yeah. Um, so get, I want to get into the book a little bit. So as you were, as you were researching this, um, you know, there, there's, like I said, different storylines. They talk about the Japanese players, how they, how they, you know, got into baseball and, and how the Americans were recruited. When, when the American team arrived in Japan, um, you know, there was all sorts of pomp and circumstances, people, you know, waving flags and all that. Um, did they feel that the American players feel like that was genuine or, or it was somewhat, um, choreographed by the by the Japanese people, i.e., government, to make you know to make it come across as as a as a more welcoming society than perhaps they really felt towards the U.S. Um, American players were convinced it was genuine, and um, and actually I am too. Um, <laughs> there wasn't much government involvement in this tour other than the kind of general helping out. Um, it was all the brainchild of the Yomiri Shinbun, the Yomiri newspaper. Um, one of the things I did as a researcher is I wanted to find, to help the storyline, evidence of animosity towards the US players. So in one trip to Tokyo, I think this book took two or three trips to Tokyo, we went in the National Archives and we went to the right-wing newspapers section. And my researcher and I went through the microfilms for the, the months that the tour happened in all the right-wing newspapers and looked for baseball. And we found one article and all it said was the baseball players will be playing. There was no editorials and these were editorial newspapers pretty much, you know, right-wing. Um, so there was no um, editorials about the evils of baseball or the evils of the United States baseball players. So I had no kind of smoking gun to show um, animosity towards the players. And really, I have no evidence that there was. Interesting. Interesting. So did, did the uh, um, throughout the book, you mentioned... Um, many opportunities for the Americans to go to different places in Japan 
and be hosted and eat and drink and do all that amongst themselves. But there, there weren't many um, occurrences written about that, that I could remember or the folks on the phone could uh, remember about the American and Japanese players mingling during the, during the tour. What kind of opportunities were there for the two sides to get together? Well, there were opportunities. The biggest one was the um, the opening party at um, at uh, Count uh, Okuma's house. Um, that was happened, I think, uh, day one or day two. Um, I can't remember if it was before the first game or right after. I, you know, it just slips my mind. Uh, both teams were there at the time. Um, and then before some of the games, they they posed together for for photographs. There's a huge language barrier. Um, there are only a couple people on the Japanese team that could speak English. And most of these ball players... Couldn't use Mo Berg as a translator? <laughs> Mo Berg's Japanese is probably as good as mine. <laughs> um, the fact Mo Berg speaking Japanese is pretty much a myth. Um, he, he had a gift for languages. Let's be, you know, we can't deny that. And in the two or three weeks that he studied on board... And the few months that he was there, I think in 32, he probably did pick up enough conversational Japanese that it probably was better than mine, actually, after two years. But he couldn't carry on a true conversation. Um, there's no evidence that he did. There's even a couple, um, I think I came across a note that said, oh, yeah, there's this funny American who's trying to speak Japanese, but we, you know, at this cute type, you know, comment. Um, there was Jimmy Horio, who, of course, was bilingual from Hawaii. Um, but there's there's no kind of remembrances or, or any evidence written down about the American players talking about the Japanese. But we have to remember that these are not highly educated American ball players. They're superstars, but there's not a lot of these people went over. They, they enjoyed the trip. They, it was a trip of a lifetime, but they're not sitting there writing diaries about, um, you know, the history of the Kamakura Great Buddha or anything like that. Right. The um, it, it took some uh, arm twisting to get a few of the players to to get on board. Um, in general, did you know? Back in that time frame in the 30s, um, I mean, the world was a pretty big place, right? I mean, relative to today where, you know, you could travel all over the place. I mean, these guys were on ships, right, going across the ocean. Um, was that the main reason people didn't want to participate in the All-Star event? Or, I mean, what what were the biggest drawbacks, you know, other than the what is it, a week or two weeks on a ship to get over there? Yeah, I, th I think so. I don't really have really strong evidence. Uh, Joe Cronin, I believe, broke his leg. He was going to go. Um, Rick Farrell was going to be the catcher for the team. I don't remember what happened to him, but he dropped out at the last minute, which is one of the reasons why they called Mo Berg. Right. Um, I think it was that it was going to – they. Had, most of the players had just finished up a long season. They were looking forward to time with their families or time off doing whatever they wanted to do. And here it was, then they'd have to get on a ship and they'd lose over two months of their off season uh, traveling around. And um, so I think a lot of them chose to stay home for that reason. And what, kind of what kind of remuneration did the players receive? You know, I don't remember. There was some, but it wasn't a ton of money. Um, there was some, and of course, all their expenses were paid. Right. So, I mean, back then, ball players worked real jobs too in the off season. So, uh, I was wondering if part of the um, part of the draw was, hey, you could still play ball and and make money, and and it would, you know, it would. Uh, offset anything you would lose by not working in your off during your off season. Yeah. Um, I don't know, probably for some players, but that may have been the reason they had trouble getting some of the players as well. Right. 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 What were there? 
Uh, did you find in your research any threats of violence against the Americans while they were on the tour? Directly, no, or that would have been the, the climax of the book. I looked really, <laughs> really hard. Um, all I have is that if the coup did attend, uh, and did actually get pulled off, they would have been right in the center of it. But exact threats, no. I, w I mean, I really looked hard. <laughs> Did, did any did any of the players? Um, you said they they had occasion to get a couple occasions to get together with their their Japanese counterparts. Did any of the players develop long term relationships with some of the Japanese players, and did they kind of keep keep in touch after the after the trip? Other than Lefty O'Doul, I think the answer is no. Um... I know Babe Ruth did not. Now, Satoru Suzuki, you know, if, if you recall, Satoru Suzuki was the, um, he's considered kind of the traveling secretary of the American All-Star team. He was an employee for the Omiuri newspaper. He was sent over to help get the team, to bring them over, to chaperone them. Um, and he was completely bilingual. Now, he stayed in touch with most of the players. And when, if you spend enough time on eBay, you will see greeting cards, Christmas cards from Satoru Suzuki to many of the players dated hmm. from the uh, from after World War II, even. So he did stay in touch. But um, as far as I'm trying to think, other than Lefty O'Doul, I'm pretty sure none of the players ever returned to Japan. And... I don't think any of the Japanese players, other than Suzuki, came to the U.S. after the war. I could be wrong on that, but I don't think so. Got so it. the answer is no. Okay. And um, Lefty O'Doul had um, had a prominent role in the in the book. Um, have you ever considered kind of? Focusing on Lefty as a as a character and writing some deep book about him. Well, I had, except uh, that Dennis Snelling uh, beat me to it. He's written a biography of Lefty O'Doul that is wonderful. It, it was a finalist for the Casey Award, and my opinion should have won it. It's a great book, and uh, if you're interested in international baseball or even just a fascinating uh, American ball player, I highly recommend. Uh, Dennis Snelling's Lefty O'Doul book. But he was only a finalist. So obviously there's some flaws there that you can improve on. And, and... <laughs> we can never understand, you know, uh, <laughs> the pol I don't want to say politics, but it, you know, people have different opinions on what makes a baseball book. So right. the awards are sometimes, I, you know, I, I, I got lucky one year and um, you know, there's the next year, the same books could have come up and I, and I wouldn't have made it finalists. So it's really the, uh, the, you know what what the committee enjoys personally right um another another character in the in the story was mo berg and uh two years ago ava um or aviva kempner came out with the, a spy behind uh home plate did you did she ever reach out to you during during her creation of that uh film and and uh get your opinion on mo and his exploits in japan absolutely um well actually i have a uh what is it imd what, what's the uh imd I, imbd yes i now have an imbd entry thanks to that uh the movie so i am in the movie um i talked to aviva yeah pretty extensively uh we did oh my gosh three hours of filming it was um at the time of the New York City Sabre Conference. Mm -hmm. It was about 98 degrees, and we did it in an Upper West Side apartment with no air conditioning. <laughs> and all I can remember wearing, I think I finally ditched the jacket because there was just sweat pouring down, you know, <laughs> to do this uh, interview. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy the movie. I think it's pretty good. Um, what she did is for my own interview, I was pretty adamant that Moberg was not a spy in Japan. 
there's no evidence that he was. Um, she managed to cut out that part of my interview and have the, uh, the, the audience think that I think it could have happened. But um, that's my only beef with it. You, the best part of your interview ended up on the cutting room floor. Is that what you're saying? Well, the truth ended up on the cutting room floor. The best <laughs> part of the interview is the, the entertainment, right? <laughs> so she knew what she was doing. Yeah. Did did uh, did you learn <clears throat> anything new about Babe Ruth during the research of the book that you didn't know going in, or or any preconceived notions that were? Yeah. You know. <laughs> I read a bunch of his biographies as background. And then I went and read as many newspaper articles and primary sources as I could about the tour. And what I was surprised about was, I came away feeling that Ruth was an, a very intelligent individual. He was actually the field manager. Um, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in the book, you know, during this tour. Connie Mack was not. and. I got the feeling a uh, Ruth in my mind came off better as a, as a uh, more controlled, intelligent fellow that a lot of his biographers or that the popular press um, lets him on or, or depicts him as. Um, maybe the reasons for that is his wife came along. He was older. Um, but I was a little bit surprised about that. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you put the address of his uh, New York uh, residence in there. I, I texted it to my daughter and her boyfriend. Her, her boyfriend's a uh, avid uh, uh, Yankees fan. And so they're, they, they live maybe three miles from there. So they're going to, uh, they're going to go look at it. Is there, I haven't been there, obviously. Is there any plaque or anything up there to commemorate that he lived there? I don't know. I, you know, I actually never went and looked, even though I was, I was across town when I wrote the book. Uh, I was uh, on the East East River and uh, the Babes Riverside Apartments on the west side. So I actually yeah. never went across town to look at it. I think the address may have changed. I think there may have been a renumbering. Um, oh yeah, because I, I put the I put put it in and Google Maps showed the. Oh, did it? Okay. And it and it is multi-story. So if he lived up on the you know, yeah. 13th or 15th floor, there there were that many in the in the picture that showed, so. Yeah. Where does your daughter live, what neighborhood? Uh, you know, I, I wish I could tell you. She's in the upper, on the Upper East Side, though. That's where I used to live, yeah. Okay. So um, we're, we're all going prospecting, right? Is that the idea? We're gonna look exactly. buried in the dirt. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. No, no, that's fine. Uh, so um, when the Americans returned uh, in 1949 with another baseball tour, how did that welcome differ from the welcoming that the uh, group received in the 30s? Well, the SEALs were, were welcomed with, with really with open arms and great enthusiasm. Um, there is a story, I think I put it in this book, I, I can't quite remember that in one of the games, one of the SEALs games, um, the players and Lefty O'Doul were really surprised how quiet the fans were. Um, and um, and Lefty made some sort of comment, I think it was to Cappy Harada, uh, who was a lieutenant who was kind of helping out with the tour, um, saying something like, what's happened to them? There's no enthusiasm. And, and Cappy supposedly says to Lefty, well, that's why you're here, to build morale and, and, and make the Japanese people happy again. And uh, so that's what the, the SEALs tour was all about. It was about rebuilding those bridges through baseball. And that tour was a great success. Um, Dennis talks about the tour in his book. It's a, it's a good chapter. Um, that book also des deserves a full length history. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to quite write another full length tour history at this point, but um, that tour is very important, both for international relations and I think for Japanese baseball. So, so they were um, contrary to what you experienced 
in the when when you went where it was loud and rambunctious that that wasn't that and, and it, that also came across in the book i i felt during this tour it was a fairly uh, boisterous type of crowd when they were watching the games that that the is that true i think so um japanese baseball in the 1950s and early 1960s was a very quiet affair uh, mm -hmm. most of the time um it wasn't as loud as it is now now i've talked to a bunch of players and some japanese players and what they say well of course the tours were quiet because there was nothing really to get too excited about. Um, it wasn't a league game. It was an exhibition game. You were there to watch the major league players. So you kind of wanted them to do well. Yes. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't there. It wasn't like you were cheering only for the Japanese to win. You really wanted to absorb the game and watch baseball. So they, so there were still riots during some league games in Japan in the early fifties with, with, with fans getting out of control and getting too excited. But the tours have always been fairly quiet um, affairs. Interesting. Yeah. Um, how did you pick the plot lines that you chose for the book? So what happened was um, originally I wasn't really interested in the 1934 tour. Um, and we had a Sabre meeting in Tokyo. And we are talking to Tokyo, this is a long time ago. This is like year 2000, maybe. Um, and we are talking about, you know, do we want to do something as the Tokyo chapter, like a, a group project? And somebody mentioned, oh, I said, what about the Dodgers tour, the 56 Dodger tour of Jackie Robinson? And someone's like, no, no, we got to do Babe Ruth tour. And we pursued that for like three, four weeks. And then nobody else wanted to do anything on it. And since I didn't really, wasn't my idea, I let it die. Um, and then about eight years later, I was looking around for a project to do. And I thought, well, what about that idea? Let me go back and kind of look at it and start researching it. So I did the baseball research. And then I started reading books lying around the house. And my wife was a... Um, history major in college, and she did her master's on World War II Japanese relations. So we had a biography of Togo, uh, Tojo lying around, and uh, I was on vacation in New Hampshire, and I'm reading this, and I see in this a one-line note about this attempted coup in 1934 in November. And uh, I'm sorry, yeah, November. Um, and you know, this light bulb, you know, just like in, in one of those cartoons, a big light bulb, you know, comes over my head and turns on. And I realize, wait a minute, this is right in the middle of the all-star tour. I've got a book here and I've got a book here that's going to be about more than baseball. And so then I sat down and I started re researching each of the lines, the coup line um, and the, um, the baseball line. And then of course we have the assassination of Shariki at the end. And it became obvious as I did research that that was actually a third line to pursue. So we have these different lines and I researched each independently, obviously. Um, but I didn't write them independently. I, I did an outline for the book. I'm, I'm a big outliner. So when I tend to write, I tend to know exactly what's in every chapter before I start the chapters. And then I just fill in the points, you know, Monday, I'm going to fill in point one, Tuesday, point two. And I work until that point is done. And then I stop. And sometimes it's at five o'clock and sometimes it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's the way I work. So I just laid it out that way. And then, of course, you edit it um, to make the, uh, the points a little sharper and the transitions come out. So during your during your research, were there any other plot lines that that came out that that, that you left out of the book because of length or was edited out because uh, others didn't feel they were appropriate? Mm -hmm. There were a few. Um, I can't really call them plot lines, and that's why they were edited out by um, Rob Taylor, the Nebraska editor, but they were darn good stories. <laughs> um, and the 
the two that I enjoyed the, the most, uh, the, the best story is that of Victor Starfin. Um, I think I put in a, a few pages about him. He is the Russian born kid who grew up in Japan and ended up being a Hall of Fame pitcher in the Japanese leagues. And he gets his first taste of pro ball during um, this tour. He had a real, I think I, I do talk about it very briefly. He had an uh, interesting life and included his father being arrested uh, for the, a murder um, in his tea house. And so in the first draft, that was probably over a chapter and it was broken up in several places and it was put in throughout the book so that readers could kind of follow that plot line. But like I said, it was a small plot line. That was edited out. Um, Rob thought that it was distracting from the overall story. The other thing that was let, uh, let out is I enjoyed, by the way, I enjoy detective stories, um, mysteries. That's what I read. Other than, I actually don't read much baseball. I read mysteries in uh, my free time. So the other thing that appealed to me is Shariki, owner of the uh, Yomari newspaper, was a detective for a while. And so to build the background to him, of him, I went into some of the crimes he solved. And he became very famous in Japan for solving a uh, grisly murder that was front page headlines. And, and I found that to be a fascinating story. Um, the way he finally got a confession is he uh, brought the body of the deceased into the, um, into the interrogation room. And uh, like left, I think the person was in an urn or something and had been cremated at this point uh, on the table while he interviewed the person he was sure to committed the crime until the person broke down and uh, confessed. And so I spent a lot of time on this particular um, investigation and that was cut. And that, did that happen during the same time frame as the oh, tour? That's why it was cut. It was early. Uh, yeah, it was, got it. Yeah. Got it, got it. Um, Jimmy Horio, uh, what, um, what would you say he was like a class A ball player? I mean, like what level of skill was he, and and how did he, um, how did he become so enamored with his own abilities? Um, that's a good question. <clears throat> You know, having written this a long time ago now, I don't remember what level he was in the minor leagues when he came. It was a class, was it class A? I, I just don't remember. I, I don't know. No, he was he was a good ball player, but um, you know, I, I guess he was not a major major league right. prospect, or else they would have signed him up since he wanted to come over. Um, right so badly um I, I i can't really answer that to be honest with you. well what um what do you think why did it take so long then for a japanese professional baseball player obviously we had relations you know baseball relationships back into the 30s so why did it take so long for the first person to come to the u.s I think there's three reasons. Um, bigotry had a great deal to do with it. There were, of course, Japanese American ball players. Whether any of them were strong enough in the teens, twenties, or thirties to make the major leagues, I don't know. Um, but I think it is likely that a lot of them were not encouraged or were not signed. They certainly weren't signed at the lower levels. Um, there was no, I mean, there's only a handful of, of Japanese or Chinese who were signed at the, at the minor league level, um, before World War II. Um, what you also have in Japan is Japanese players who, who did not speak great English and they were stars. Um, in the 1920s and early 30s, Japanese college baseball was almost like professional. It was like, it's like uh, my beef against uh, college basketball. I mean, you're really watching professional base, uh, basketball players at the college level. Um, 
Japanese baseball, college baseball was the same way. These, these guys were on the front pages of magazines and newspapers. Um, they weren't getting money, but all their life desires were being taken care of. Um, so would they come over? I don't know if they would have come over if asked. They certainly weren't going to come over for a low minor league contract. Um, and they probably would never be um, asked. So I think those are, I mean, they're pretty much the, those three kind of sum it up. Right, right, right. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Robert? I've been doing all the yammering <laughs> because you sent me all the questions. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't come up with all those. I, I'm not, uh, not that thorough of a documenter as I read to come up with all those questions. Frank did all that, you know, <laughs> yes. I have a, well, I guess. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I appreciate uh, any time I read a book, my wife has to listen to me uh, <laughs> talk about it. But the uh, little squabbles between the uh, the Ruth women and the Garrix women, I thought was a nice touch in there. And, uh, I, I, I had never heard those stories. I thought it was uh, well done. Thanks. Thanks. I actually got in trouble for some of that. Um, the allegations of a possible affair between Eleanor Gehrig and Babe Ruth is comes out of uh, the Big Bam. Um, was it um, Montefiore, I think? Did he write that? I, I'm slipping the last name. And um, when Bonsai came out, I was in touch with um, Julia Ruth Stevens and, and her family, and they liked it. And then um, Gomez's daughter read it and was incensed that that was in there. And uh, boy, I got some nasty phone calls. <laughs> and um, I had to admit that that was one of the few times I actually used a secondary source and I didn't have a primary source for that. And uh, the Gomez family, um, I, I forget, uh, does anybody remember um, Gomez's daughter's first name? Was it Verona maybe? Or um, she, she said she would have known. Her mother and her were so close that uh, that if this had happened, she would have known, and it did not happen. It was all a kind of a rumor and media type uh, invention. So that's the one part of the book that I got in trouble for. <laughs> so was there is is there any and you is there any uh, documented uh, stories about that in the New York papers back in the day? Now I know back in those days they never they they left people's private lives alone. I mean, today it would, they'd have 10 Instagrams and all sorts, you know. Right. But back then, did, was there anything written? I didn't find anything. Um, you know, I, I didn't find anything. And that's why I, I relied on the, the biography, which I shouldn't, right. have, which I shouldn't have done. I mean, it's, when you, when you finish a book, yeah, then it gets out there and people come up and find mistakes. You know, most of the mistakes are minor, but that's a mistake I regret doing. Yeah. A little bit of salaciousness, never heard a book. I'm sorry, Frank? A little bit of salacious talk. <laughs> exactly. That's true. <laughs> that's right. I appeal to everyone on that. Yeah. That's right. Sex, espionage, and baseball. What more do you want in the book? <laughs> that's something else I looked for. I looked for any sort of uh, torrid tales, you know, that the players might have been involved in. Um, I found no evidence of them, which means nothing. Um, there's plenty of rumors that the Yankees and Dodgers were up to stuff in the 1950s, and I have found no evidence other than the rumors. So, um, yeah, things happened in Japan, uh, especially yeah. with the un unmarried players, of course, um, you know, with whose wives were not with them. Right. Um, but there's, you know, there's no evidence that survives of that back in the papers in those days. Oh, right. So, Rob, about the 1931 tour, right, there, there were pretty much requests that these players don't come back. Right. Yes. What did they do? Is that what, what you're going to ask? Do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they must have done something where, I mean. You had um, Rabbit Moranville there, who was, you know, he's a real asshole. <laughs> you know, back in the days where being a good old boy was thought as being funny, he was a jerk. And um, so he made himself pretty unwelcome. Um, 
they seem to be kind of a disrespectful lot overall. Um, you know, there's some talk about them um, showboating on the field, which they were doing. And then there's the question is, when they were, you know, the type of things they did during Barnstorm with the outfield would, would lie on the grass why uh, Lefty Grove struck out the side. Um, there's some discussion that uh, some of the Japanese players found that very disrespectful, and they, they would have. It's a very cultural difference. Fans loved it, just as the fans loved it in the States. I doubt the opposing players in the States enjoyed it very much either. Um, so I think, yeah. But there's probably something else that happened. There's also a tour in 21 where they got in trouble and I can't figure out exactly why, but something that did not hit the press happened. And- uh, That's a mystery. Yeah. Um, I have one last, one question about um, E.G. Sawamura. The, the, you know, naming a, the pitching award after him, right? The Japanese baseball, the equivalent of the Cy Young, um, it's amazing what limited time his baseball career really is. Right. And the fact that he's a national hero seems to me to be the reason why he gets the, the award named after him. Correct. That, you know, that's a sad story, actually. It is. Um, I don't remember what is exactly in this book and what I wrote for a subsequent Sabre article. It's in the 50-50 um, book that just came out. I, I don't remember how much is, is reprinted. Um, but, you know, Sawamura was a national hero. He was a national symbol, right? And I think I, I think it's in this book. I talk about how the, the three levels of him being a symbol through time. Yeah, so, so the, yeah, that's, I mean, that's why he's, the hero it has the award named after him you know he was a great pitcher no doubt mm -hmm. um you know victor starfin was a better pitcher but they're not going to name the japanese award after him yeah i mean the, the you do have the sawamura stuff in the book yeah okay it is yeah but the, the the to me one of the great things about the book is its accessibility because you you went ahead and you sort of gave us the cast of characters and so many of us don't know the cast of characters right, right? And then you try to carry them to the end and, and say, okay, how these plot lines kind of uh, wrap up. And, and unfortunately, not a lot of them ended pleasantly. No. One of the things I've tried to do um, since I started writing is one of my goals is to introduce the Japanese game and the Japanese players to American audience. There's so many great stories out there. There's so many great players. And uh, it, it's really parallel to what's happening in the last few years with the Negro Leagues. You know, now we finally, uh, the recognition that this week, and we're, I think we're gonna see as, as baseball fans and as baseball um, researchers and Sabre, we're gonna see great interest in the Negro Leagues across the country now. And I think it's going to open up many opportunities for writers and for research uh, to, to get to a wider audience. Um, I would love to do something similar to Japanese baseball, which is reach a wider audience. I don't, I'm not advocating that they're a major league. They're, they're their own league. Um, and so when I'm writing this book, I picked the, the people I wanted to follow through carefully. There's lots of other guys on the team who I barely mentioned. I only mention if they hit a home run or something like that because the stories weren't as good and there's just too many Japanese names for uh, an English speaker to remember. And that's something right. in all my books I struggle with is you, even I have trouble with foreign names. If I'm the Japanese, I, I've lived there enough that they don't feel that foreign to me, but um, I have trouble remain, you know, remembering say Russian names. Uh, and um, so I try to keep the uh, Japanese characters to a minimum um, just for the reader's sake. Do you, do you think the behavior of the team, the good behavior of the team was more of, out of their respect for Connie Mack perhaps than the team that came before them? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think Connie Mack definitely helped. And I think the, the talk that Connie Mack gave in Vancouver is mentioned by um, in more than one places in, in, the, in, in articles and in player remembrances that have been published. 
Um, I think that Connie Mack being there and emphasizing the importance of the tour. Yeah, I think it really did matter. I think that's a really good point. Any other any other questions yeah. for author? Ted, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wondered about Japanese baseball today. If if Rob feels it is, you know, you, and you hinted at it, but it, is it major league yet or soon to be? What, what do you think? You know, I think that's a a tough question. Um, is it major league? Are the teams on par with major league teams? I would say most of them, if, if you combine the two leagues, right, you know, magically, and you had interleague play, most of the Japanese teams would not be winning teams. I think the, the, the top Japanese teams would be. Um, what I believe when I watch Japanese baseball, um, and this had been my argument for the Negro League baseball, but I, now I, I think I might have been wrong, is – the elite of each team are major league stars. The elite of each Japanese team would be major league stars. The core of the starting players could play in the major leagues. And we saw that in Japan with um, Iguchi and Taguchi, who were occasional all-stars, but were decent American players, you uh, major league players when they came over. But the bottom of the teams are not major league caliber. They're triple caliber. Um, that's kind of been my take on the Japanese uh, teams. Um, now, whether you can call that major league or, or, or 4A, which is what a lot of people will call the Japanese teams, I, I honestly don't know. I think it's kind of definitional. So. That's, in some ways, that's true of, I don't know, probably 20 of the rosters in major league baseball these days right if you look at if you look at players 20 to 25 you know um they're they're simply guys that come up and down from from triple a there really are kind of four a players and you know if you if you talk to some of the old timers like uh like frank and ted they would say they would never have made a roster back when they were kids yeah i, I think that's probably true and um, one of the things that came out of um, the Remembering Japanese Baseball, the, the oral history book, is a lot of the players like uh, Greg Boomer Wells um, won triple crowns. He won two triple crowns in um, Japan. And people would use pe him, people, American fans would use players like Boomer Wells and Randy Bass and saying, well, how, that's evidence that the Japanese leagues aren't strong because these guys were 4A players in the States. You know, they couldn't make a major league roster and yet they're superstars in Japan. Um, that might be true, but at the same time, these fellas were blocked by stars in front of them in the major leagues, um, were definitely talented and they were able to adapt to Japanese baseball. And that's why they excelled. There's plenty of Americans who were stars here or came back and did well in Japan. Who, I'm sorry, who did well in the major leagues who did not do well in Japan because they couldn't adapt. So there's a lot more going on. It's not a one-to-one, -one, right. um, you know, shift. You have to adapt culturally as well. Right. Ted, go ahead. You're on mute, Ted. Uh, do you have any Charlie Manuel stories you could share? <laughs> you know, I never got a chance to interview him. I really wish I had. He's quite, quite a character. By the time I was working on um, Remembering Japanese Baseball, he was already with the Phillies. And the, let's see, so the Remembering came out in 05. I can't remember if he was manager or batting coach at that time, but he started to become a big star. Even as batting coach, he was a star. And, he, and so he was not somebody I could just call up like a lot of the guys in the book. I just found their numbers on Google. You know, this is before people were worried about privacy and you just called them up and said, hey, I'd love to talk to you. Charlie was not one of those people I could get in touch with. I tried. Um, I don't have any good stories. There's a couple in remembering that uh, 
I think he and Clyde Wright, one other person, decided to have a big, yeah, you've read it, <laughs> a, a big fight. They took on the uh, Russian hockey team in a fist fight <laughs> at the park because they felt like it. <laughs> so, yeah, quite a character, and I wish I had met him at some point. Uh, I don't want to digress, but I, I have to tell you, Ted, I did, um, I managed to get some highlight films from the 70s and 80s Nippon series. And in there, I was watching last night, your boy, Charlie Manuel, <laughs> trying, to, trying to feel the ball in right field. They had no clue what to do. <laughs> but he was a beast. And maybe in one of our future meetings, I'll, I'll exhort a couple of clips. I mean, he was a beast of a guy and took a fastball in the face. Uh, oh, oh, yes. And it took him out of uh, commission for a while. Yes. Took a shot in the face that... that and that, it's on that video too. Um, I'd love yeah. to see that, Frank. If you could share it afterwards, Rob, you know that I, you know, I'd share anything about that. Thank you. The problem <laughs> is, it's all in Japanese with yeah. no subtitles. <laughs> um, matter of fact, that was my hook because it had the 1994 series on it. One of the videos I have, which was the only World Series that year. Yeah. And so that's what got me hooked, and uh, you know, so that that began my my quest with this. So I'll, I'll get the Charlie Manual clip and I'll share it with you, Rob. I promise. Cool. Any any other questions? I hope so. Come on. <laughs> Carol, you have anything? Yeah. Oh, you might have. You probably yeah. answered this when you talked about the uh, uh, comparison of the play, player levels. But is the hope uh, that the Nippon League and United States Major Leagues? would actually directly compete in some way, as you, as you mentioned in the book. Obviously, that has not happened. Is it likely to happen? And I think you kind of at least partially answered it when you talked about the disparity of the rosters. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear your take. Yeah. Um, actually, this one of the wonderful things about pandemic is all these Zoom meetings. So people who I've known for years were now getting together on these different talks. And I've had the opportunity this summer of being on panels with um, um, Jim Small, who is the head of MLB operations for Asia. And uh, he's a fascinating guy. And uh, we've been talking about that. And uh, the problem is many of the Japanese teams are not interested. Um, so for many of the Japanese teams, the baseball squads, the baseball clubs are part of a larger corporation and they're in the advertising uh, section of this corporation. A baseball clubs uh, job is to get their product name out there, hopefully by winning on the field. There's not much, um, emphasis on making a profit. So, especially in the Central League. Um, so the Pacific League is now has Pacific League Baseball, which you can subscribe to and watch any uh, Pacific League game in the United States. It's all in Japanese, but at least you can do it. Next year, they believe they're gonna start offering English um, games, which could be really tough actually to find qualified uh, commentators. I hope they do a good job with that. Um, Central League has no interest in following suit. Um, they don't see why they should bother. Um, and that's very frustrating. So until the Central League decides to market their teams globally and turn it into a profit-making uh, enterprise, I don't see um, there being a true World Series or true playoff uh, it would be grand, though. But, it would be yeah. wonderful. I love the World Baseball Classic, personally. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy watching the All-Star, the Japanese-American All-Star teams. I don't know if anybody watched the last one where the Japanese kicked the Americans, but it was beautiful baseball by the Japanese and not terribly good baseball by the Americans. Um, but it was wonderful to watch the different styles of play and how effective... Um, base stealing and hit and runs can be with the Japanese uh, doing them beautifully. So, 
Yeah, it would be it would be kind of nice to have a, like a friendly like they do in soccer. You know, like sometimes the pro soccer teams over in Europe come over and play the MLS teams. Like like a, they call them friendlies. Right. That would be that would be nice. It would be. It would be good to have the whole team. That would be great. Um, you know, one of the problems we get are, of course, the giant salaries. Um, I'm not against baseball players being paid lots of money for if they're the if if they're earning it, but because of the giant salaries, you want you worry about injuries. And economically, if you're making twenty million dollars a year, why should you go over in November to play another game? I mean, you don't need to. Um, so I think that will stop these friendlies from happening unless they happen during the spring training. And then it's not a true game because you're not dealing with players at full level or full, uh, you know, a real uh, roster. So, so there, there's problems with that, but I would love to see it too. Yeah. I, I have one last question. Did you, did you ever meet uh, Sadaharu O? I did meet him briefly. Um, when my Wally Yonamine biography came out, um, Wally was 80 years old and we had a giant party in uh, Tokyo. And uh, at that party was Sadahara O, Shigeo Nagashima and a whole slew of Japanese Hall of Famers. And um, you know, we all gave little speeches in front of the audience and, and stuff and then I, I've had a very blessed life when you realize that one of my biggest um, regrets in life is not getting a picture that day. <laughs> so here I was sharing a stage with Sadahara O oh, and I shook his hand, but I never thought to get a picture. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else before we wrap up? Well, can I plug uh, my latest book? Absolutely. So this one, uh, let's see if I can get the camera. Can you see that? Yeah. Just came off the press this week. It is a <clears throat> picture book with text about um, early Japanese American baseball. And I have just finished a uh, more academic version called Issei Baseball. And I have to admit that if you are not interested in Japanese American baseball, or the history of baseball, it might be a little dense. Um, I think it reads pretty well. I'm proud of it, but it's not going to make your um, bestseller list. Um, so what I decided to do is when pandemic is over and I'm giving book talks is to have a book that's a little bit more accessible, especially to teenagers um, or people who really don't want to sit down and read, but enjoy pictures. And it tells basically the same story of uh, Japanese American baseball with lots of pictures and fewer words. Um, so I've spent the pandemic working on self-published books, which is a lot of fun. It's the first time I've ever done it. And it's kind of fun to start a project and be holding the uh, finished result about three months after you start the project. Uh, so is it the same? It's the same as you did on the baseball card book? Same. It's the same format, same publisher. Yeah, um, a little bit more text, um, but yeah, it's the same format. I think this might be the, I'm gonna start another book that we actually talked about on Facebook, um, going to be called Japanese Baseball Cards and Stars of the Late 1940s, which is the golden age of Japanese baseball cards. And I think I'll start that maybe symbolically on January 2nd. And uh, that'll also be mostly a PDF, I think, and with a few hard copies made. Well, you're going to buy one of those, right? You, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm counting on you to buy 10 of them. Or <laughs> Put me down um, for a few. Um, I like Girl Scout cookies. cookies. <laughs> yes, exactly. Girl Scout Free Girl Scout cookies with the book. Um, so what... It's very interesting having worked with University of Nebraska, which is a wonderful publisher, but like all academic publishers are slow um, to be worked now by myself. Um, it's pretty exciting to be able to, to, to design your own book, to edit your own book, and then to get it published and get it in your hands. And the marketing part is a little more difficult, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to recommend uh, Issei Baseball's on my between semester reading list. I'm between semesters now teaching, so I have time. 
Well, I hope you like it. What I've tried to do with Issei baseball is very similar to bonsai is it follows the lives of about five different guys who come together in different points of their lives to form baseball teams and then split apart and come together again often. Mm -hmm. So the idea is all five of these people are, are born in Japan and come in the very beginning of the 20th century to the United States, wanting to be students, wanting to make millions of dollars. And instead they all decide to play baseball and form a baseball team. And they barnstorm as professionals across the Midwest in uh, 1906, 1908, and 1911. And so it follows these fellows and their barnstorming experiences and how Japanese immigrants were, I'm gonna say welcomed, but that's not the word that happened. <laughs> um, but there are tough experiences as, as immigrants and then their experiences as a all Japanese baseball team um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And then what happens to these guys uh, in the end of the book, there's a chapter about uh, World War II and their incarceration and what happens after. So once again, it's, uh, it's a lot of history, a lot of baseball and a lot of say sociology and talking about the immigrant experience and how baseball relates to that. Well, I, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I saw Adam's comment uh, yeah. that, that he's ordering it. So there's two copies out there. Yeah, um, you are also welcome. If you haven't already done it, Adam, you can go to my website, robfitz.com, and happy to sign them for you if you order through there. But if you order from Amazon, that's great too. You know. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Thanks. Sure. The, uh, the, 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 one, the one I really was happy about <clears throat> is the, the other pandemic book on Japanese cards, though. Uh, that's a good. I brought that here too, because like I said, advertising is hard. We didn't, we didn't, we, I didn't set that up with you. But the, <laughs> but the reality, uh, what I've done for this book is, as you've already heard, I love collecting Japanese baseball cards. They're far more artistic than uh, American baseball yeah. cards. They, re, they remind me, the golden age of Japanese baseball cards is the late 40s, early 50s. And those cards remind me of the tobacco cards from the 1910s, you know, yeah. 206 is uh, the Turkey Reds, which is my favorite, uh, all time favorite uh, set. Um, very colorful, very artistic. Um, so what I've done here in, the, um, in this book is an illustrated introduction to Japanese baseball cards is for the beginner, uh, the, be uh, the whole history of Japanese baseball cards right up until the present, but really focusing on the golden ages. And now I'm going to break down each section of the book and with a uh, subsequent book that will talk about the players, who they were, introduce them to the American audience, and of course the, the picture books. The idea is, you know, salivate over these pictures. So, and picture books are much easier to read. They are, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, and it, especially if you use the bigger font. Yeah, know, for us older people, so we don't have to wear our glasses. Me too. <laughs> yes, I, I think I, I use 12 or something, or 12 or 13 for the font. There you go. Well, uh, Robert, thank you very much for, uh, uh, you know, spending your time with us this morning. It was very, uh, very interesting and educational. And uh, I think we, we all enjoyed your books. And, and uh, I'm definitely going to pick up the uh, couple of your other uh books in the near near future to uh especially the uh the japanese uh uh baseball card one that sounds really interesting so I'm, I'm looking forward to see the the differences of those and i'm sure there's a lot of saber uh folks that'll pick that one up too especially the card collecting uh group will probably love that yeah i hope so hard part is getting the the word out without being what I call that guy. You know, you don't want to be on Facebook every day. Buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. Um, but if you don't do that, no one knows about it. That's right. That's right. Now feel feel free to be that guy, especially when you're doing it yourself. You do, you uh, you deserve to make some uh, some cash on it when you put that kind of effort into it. Yeah. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank you for having me so much. All right. Thanks. Hey guys, just a couple of. Uh, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, 